Hi everyone, my name is Anna Masiola. I am a pediatric intensive care unit nurse and welcome to Anaphylaxis What to Expect here at the Living Teal Global Summit. I have food allergies. I've had food allergies my entire life. I have been in anaphylaxis many times before. Actually, I was in anaphylaxis about three days before filming this presentation, so it's pretty fresh in my brain how scary it is. It is that possibility that we all think about when we go out to eat, when we really eat anything, actually. Um, it's why we educate our parents, our teachers, our peers, our roommates, our wh whoever you're around about the symptoms of anaphylaxis, what to do. It's why we have an emergency action plan. It's why we bring our own food places. Um, it's that really, really scary possibility that we all have, and it's something that we, we don't even want to think about. And if we've had anaphylaxis before, it's something that I think we always remember. And so if anaphylaxis were to happen, I think it's important to have some sort of idea of what's going to happen at the hospital. We all know what to do when we go into anaphylaxis at home. We make sure that we have our epinephrine, we administer our epinephrine, we call 911, we do all those actions that we've all trained to do, and we reassure in our heads all the time. And once we go to the hospital, what happens and why does it happen? So today we're going to talk a little bit about that. So first off, I wanted to say this presentation is very much based on the established medical anaphylaxis protocol. So just because something's in the protocol doesn't necessarily mean it's for every patient and vice versa. Just because it's not in the protocol doesn't mean it's not indicated for the patient. And this is true in all medical decisions at the hospital. Medical decisions for patients are based on a lot of factors. So um, it can definitely vary in treatment. Um, so yeah, I'm super excited to get into this. Also, I wanted to say this is pre-recorded. So if you guys have any questions throughout this presentation, drop them in the chat box. I will be available live throughout this presentation to answer any questions you may have throughout the presentation. So don't be afraid to add any comments or ask any questions throughout the presentation. So let's get started. There we go. All right, a little bit about me before we uh, before we head into anaphylaxis. I am from Tucson, Arizona. I am a desert dweller. I grew up here. It is a beautiful place. So if you ever have a chance to visit, it's really great. We have a lot of mountain ranges and a lot of hiking and rock climbing and outdoorsy things to do. So it's uh, a beautiful place. I work as an RN in a pediatric intensive care unit. Uh, pediatric critical care is my passion. It is something that I am so lucky to be able to do. I am learning something new every day. It is a great job and I feel very lucky to take care of the patients that I do. I personally am allergic to eggs, dairy, chicken, turkey, peanuts, and tree nuts. So I am with you all with the multiple food allergies and I have asthma and eosinophilic esophagitis as well. So I am with you guys with all of your allergy struggles. I am right there with you. I also love to swim, hike, rock climb, and do anything outdoors. So if you look to the right, we have some pictures. I am climbing a mountain. Uh, it, that's Mount Lemon, and that was a super fun day for me. I got to do some really cool climbing. It was a beautiful day outside. Um, and so yeah. Oh, I love rock climbing. It's just so fun. It's such a challenge. Uh, at the bottom, that's a picture of me hiking in Sedona, Arizona. If you've ever been to Sedona, it's a beautiful place. It's a little bit more north Arizona, kind of by Flagstaff. And that is a place with some beautiful red rocks, uh, also beautiful trees and hikes and streams and all kinds of cool stuff. And then there's a picture of me with my family's dogs, but I'm kind of hiding my face. Uh, on the left, that's a picture of Laika. She's a little white labradoodle super sweet dog. That is my sister's dog. And then in my arms is baby Colby. He's a labradoodle puppy that my parents got it back in March. And he's so cute. He's a teen dog now. He's, he's a little bit of a stinker, so he goes to puppy lessons. Uh, but he's super cute. He is just the joy in our family and is just creating so much joy in these quarantine days. Um, so yeah, if you have any pets, share them with me. I love Super cute. All right, let's get started. So what is anaphylaxis? Anaphylaxis is a severe systemic reaction to a specific allergen. It has to include at least two body systems um, for it to be considered anaphylaxis. And in more severe cases, it results in a compromise of the airway, breathing, and or circulation. So airway, breathing, and circulation are called the ABCs, and they are what healthcare workers used to prioritize what needs to be done first in a patient. 
So they want to make sure airway, your airway is open, the body is getting oxygen into the lungs, breathing, the patient is able to actually bring that oxygen to the lungs in order for it to be exchanged for carbon dioxide in the alveoli, which are at the bottom of the lungs, and or circulation. Circulation is your blood pumping throughout your body. Blood has oxygen. Blood is what's going to make sure that oxygen is given to your organs in order for your organs to work properly. That's how our body functions. So we want to make sure those three things are definitely, definitely done and done correctly. So we're going to use those three things to kind of study what is done in the hospital and why we do it. So let's talk about the symptoms of anaphylaxis first. And these are uh, definitely later symptoms. So bronchoconstriction, that is your airway closing. That is the constriction of the bronchi in your lungs. That is when it when your, feels like your airway is breathing, closing and you can't breathe. That's that bronchoconstriction. Second, swelling of the tongue slash pharynx. Tongue, it's swelling, that's when your tongue gets really big and like really tingly. And then pharynx, your throat. So it's when you have that swelling in your throat and it really hurts to swallow. And that's always a risk because we don't want that airway to close off, right? Hypotension which is a fancy way of saying low blood pressure. Tachycardia, uh, that is increased heart rate. And we're gonna get into why those things happen in a little bit. Nausea and vomiting and abdominal cramps. That's when we feel like we're gonna puke. A lot of times vomiting occurs in anaphylaxis um, and it just, your stomach hurts so bad. And then you have that flushed skin, severe pruritus, itching and hives. And that's super common in really any allergic reaction. To your left is a diagram of some symptoms. Uh, we'll start with airway, that's that coughing, shortness of breath, wheezing, chest pain or tightness, tightening of the throat, difficulty swallowing. Um, that'll definitely happen in a severe case of anaphylaxis. Skin, uh, hives, swelling, itchiness, that redness, warmth. We've, I'm sure we've all had that before. Uh, let's go to heart. Heart, uh, having a faint pulse, um, a pale or blue color, especially in your fingertips and your toes. Uh, dizziness, a weak pulse, that's that thing, pulse again, shock, and a loss of consciousness, that's when you don't have enough blood to your brain. And then stomach, uh, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, stomach pain or cramps. And then let's go up to brain. Brain symptoms, anxiety, anaphylaxis is scary, trust me, been there. Confusion, headache, feeling like something bad is about to happen. That is what's called the impending sense of doom. And that is a, that's what happens when, if you hear those stories of children that maybe say to their parents, is this when I'm gonna die? Like, should I say my last words to you now? Like, they'll just sit there and be like, I'm gonna die, something's, something's gonna happen. That's that feeling that the body has that it's something not very good is going on. All right, next. So during the immune response, histamine is released. Histamine is what causes the bronchi in the lungs to contract and get tighter. That's that bronchoconstriction you're talking about. The GI muscles are gonna contract. That's gonna cause that, those abdominal cramps, nausea, the vomiting. Blood vessels are going to dilate and vascular permeability increases. That's when the blood vessel walls get thinner. We're gonna talk a little bit about why that happens in a little bit. So epinephrine, our number one treatment. It's what we carry around in our EpiPens. Epinephrine relaxes the smooth muscle, which is the type of muscle in your lungs and your gut, uh, to help keep your airways open. Um, that, that's going to relieve that bronchoconstriction. And then second, it constricts blood vessels, increasing blood flow to your organs increasing blood pressure and reducing swelling. And we're gonna get into that in just a second. And it increases your heart rate and attempt to get more blood to your organs. All right, so we're gonna draw a little picture of a blood vessel here. And forgive my, forgive my drawing, I'm not an artist. So here is a blood vessel, right? Okay, so let's say that blood is moving in this direction. And there's like a bunch of blood here, right? All right, and it's flowing to all of your other organs, right? We're gonna, let's draw a kidney. Oh, this is not gonna be, not gonna be the best kidney, but kidney. <laughs> Great, okay. So blood is flowing, blood is flowing. All right, histamine's released. So 
what's going to happen is your blood vessel is going to dilate and that means to get bigger. So I'm gonna show here in blue. We're gonna say our blood vessel dilates to about there, right? Also, the blood vessel walls get thinner, meaning there are tiny little holes that allow the blood to escape into the interstitium. And the interstitium is the space between the cells outside the blood vessel. So let's draw little cells. Oh, let's pick a different color. Let's go oh, pink. So we're going to say these are cells. All right, so we have our blood. Our blood is going to pour out of these tiny little holes into the interstitium. And normally this space should not have anything in it, right? So this blood flow is going to cause swelling or edema, right? Great, okay, so that's what happens when that blood pours out of the vessels and the vessel walls get thinner and they dilate, meaning that there's more space, your blood pressure is going to drop because that blood is going into the interstitium, it's no longer in the blood vessel space. Alrighty, when this happens, there is no blood for your organs, right? So the heart is working really hard to pump as much blood to your, all your organs to make sure they function correctly, right? So if all the blood is in the interstitium and there's no blood in the blood vessel on the road to the organs, your organs aren't able to get enough blood slash oxygen to function correctly. So that is what's called the physiological state of shock. So your kidney, for example, is going to be like, um, excuse me, I don't have my oxygen supply to function normally. Brain, what, what's going on here? Brain is like, okay, I'll, I'll tell heart to, to pump some more uh, to make sure like more blood gets to you. And kidney's like, okay, great, thanks, appreciate that. And meanwhile, heart's like, I'm so tired, I don't have enough blood. Cardiac output is low. Cardiac output is how much blood the pump, the heart is able to pump out. And because there's no blood to pump, right? So we're gonna give epinephrine, right? Epinephrine, we'll do, we'll do epinephrine in green. Epinephrine is gonna bring that west vessel wall together. It is a vasopressor. And in doing that, it is going to make the blood vessel thinner. It's going to constrict it. It's going to increase the blood pressure. So epi is going to increase blood pressure. Does that make sense? And it's going to hopefully contain enough blood for uh, the blood vessel to hold to stay on the road to your organs right? And along with fluids, fluids are going to help with that to make sure the circulation stays in your body, right? Does that make sense? Hopefully that diagram helped a little bit for you. All right, we're going to clear this. All right. So when you get to the hospital, first thing they're going to want to do is get rid of the allergen, assuming you still can. Now, if you ingested eggs, for example, and it's already in your body, obviously you can't do anything about that, it's not going to be necessarily the number one first priority to find out what caused anaphylaxis. If you have a bee sting, if you're allergic to bees and you still have the stinger in your arm or wherever you got stung, they're going to want to remove that, remove the origin of the reaction. They're going to definitely ask you when you come to the ER, they're going to be like, okay, what happened? Um, and you obviously can tell them, but if the patient is in serious seriously, uh, serious, serious, excuse me, serious critical condition, uh, it's not necessarily the first priority to figure out what caused it. So number two, intramuscular epinephrine. That is what they're going to give. If you haven't given it already, uh, that is number one, the first thing they're going to do. And it doesn't necessarily need to be in an auto injector. At the hospital, they have it in vials, so they'll uh, pull it up in a syringe and needle. Like, for example, when I was in anaphylaxis, they put my epinephrine in my arm, not in my leg. Um, you can use your auto injector. Um, that's just what they do at the hospital. Second, give lots of fluids. So that's what we we're talking about with that uh, 
blood, you wanna increase that fluid in your vessel to make sure circulation and your heart can pump out enough blood. Uh, that'll go through an IV and will increase circulation and blood pressure. So number four, give, an ex give extra oxygen through a mask if needed. Uh, if a patient comes in and they're having trouble breathing, um, their oxygen saturation is low, uh, oxygen will definitely be indicated. And they're going to continue to monitor vitals. Uh, they're gonna monitor your blood pressure, heart rate, oxygen saturation, respiratory rate, and temperature. They're also gonna give um, other treatments probably, but we'll get into those in a little bit. So here is a peripheral IV. A peripheral IV is typically what a lot of patients get when they get go into the hospital. It is the way that the healthcare team has access to your vasculature. Um, they wanna give medications uh, quickly to you, so they wanna make sure that you have uh, access, quick access to your vasculature also, so you don't have to get poked every time. So uh, here on your left is a picture of, uh, this is like a faint picture of the veins underneath the person's arm and showing that uh, the catheter is in your vein, and then there's a little tubing that's typically taped onto your skin, and that little uh, hub right there um, at the top, the white part, that is what they'll use to screw on like a syringe and give medica medication. Uh, common myth, there is no needle in a peripheral IV. A needle is taken out right when we put it in, so uh, it's literally a catheter in the vein with a big sticker over it. So on your right, that is a little baby IV, just to show you one in pediatrics. Uh, typically, they'll either be on the hand, they'll be on the forearm, they'll be on your upper arm. Uh, babies sometimes have them on their, like really little babies sometimes have them on their head, um, on their feet. They could really be anywhere. Um, typically, or in, in the emergency room, they do a lot of uh, IVs in the antecubital space, and that's the space between your arm and forearm, um, just because it's really easy access. Uh, there's a quick, easy vein there. Uh, typically, when a patient's admitted, we don't like to do antecubital uh, peripheral IVs because um, if you've ever had one before, I had one a couple of days ago, they're not necessarily too, too comfortable. Um, so we try to avoid those, but sometimes we need to in emergency situations. And then that's just on an adult hand. Um, the dressings and the types of tubing and everything obviously vary uh, per hospital. But here's one, uh, so you're, uh, you know what you expect a little bit. Next, uh, IV pump and vitals monitor. You're pretty much guaranteed to see these. So this is an Alaris pump on your left. Uh, that uh, pump is what we use to set a certain rate and volume that we want fluid to go in for a patient. We also use this for medications, for uh, a blood transfusion, really anything that we put into the vasculature, we put onto this Alaris pump. It doesn't necessarily need to be Alaris. They vary throughout the hospital, but these are pretty commonly seen. Uh, the bag of fluid on your left, that is uh, saline. Saline is typically the fluid that they'll use in anaphylaxis. Uh, we use tubing to spike the bag, um, and then we attach the, the tubing into the blue channel that's on the left there, and we use the end to hook onto your IV, and we set the rate and the amount. And these things beep a lot, uh, so if you hear a lot of beeping, it's pretty typical. On your right is, let's talk about the vitals monitor at the top. That is just an example of um, what you'll see in the hospital. Uh, at the top, that green number, that is the heart rate. In adults, uh, normal heart rate is 60 to 100. Um, in uh, like normal as in normal range, it's not necessarily normal for everyone, but that is what's considered normal. So that's 79. So this patient is, uh, has, has an okay heart rate. Second number, that blue number, is your oxygen saturation. That is the blue number there. Uh, in this patient, it is 80%. Typically, uh, normal range is 92 to 100%. So this patient is low on oxygen. So hopefully some oxygen or some uh, treatment is being given to this patient to increase their oxygen level. And then that yellow number is respiratory rate. This is gonna vary uh, through age groups. Uh, typically for adults, it is 12 to 20. Um, uh, this patient has a respiratory rate of 18, so they're doing okay there. Um, back to heart rate, uh, heart rate varies throughout age groups. Um, a baby's heart rate normal range is very different than an adult's normal range, so that's also important to consider when you're looking at a patient's heart rate. Down at the bottom is a uh, oxygen saturation um, O2 probe, uh, and so that's a little uh, red light that we put on finger, we put on toes, uh, on baby's feet, 
baby's hands. Typically, it'll go on a finger though. Uh, and that will register that blue number on the monitor of your oxygen saturation. And it also uh, does, it measures your heart rate as well. But typically we like to see your EKG and through with those leads on the right side. And you're pretty much guaranteed to get those stickers as well. And those are just monitoring stickers. We give them, we put them on everyone. All right, further treatment. So what if the patient does not respond to the epi? So we're gonna go back to our airway breathing circulation, those ABCs, right? So airway. If the patient is still complaining that their throat is really swollen, they're not able to breathe all the way, if they feel like their lungs are constricting, intubation might be indicated. And that is when we use an endotracheal tube to protect the airway from closing. That tube is a physical way, a manual way of preventing the airway from swelling up enough for it to close. Breathing, ventilator. So if you, if a patient is intubated, um, they will be a, hooked up to a ventilator. Ventilator will provide the oxygen for the body to use. And just because a patient's on a ventilator doesn't necessarily mean that the ventilator is doing all the breathing for them. There are a lot of different settings on ventilators that um, either work with the patient, allow the patient to breathe on their own, allow the patient, like provide a little bit of support for the patient, or provide all the support for the patient. And that is totally up to the discretion of the medical team which setting the ventilator will be put at. And then third, circulation. We're going to increase those fluids because we want to increase the volume of the vasculature and potentially do an epinephrine drip. This is if the patient is not responding at all to intramuscular epinephrine. Um, this is definitely if the patient's in critical condition. We need to keep those organs oxygenated and that blood pressure down enough, uh, or up enough, I should say, to make sure that organs are getting enough blood. We don't want the body to be in the physiological state of shock. We're trying to prevent that. So pretty much if a patient's at this point, this is pretty much a guaranteed ICU admin. Um, when you do get to this point, if they are on an epinephrine drip, um, the medical team will titrate the dose of epinephrine based on the patient's blood pressure. So if a patient's blood pressure is uh, super low, we're going to increase that epinephrine. If a patient's blood pressure is super high, we're going to decrease that epinephrine. And that gets titrated pretty quickly depending on how the patient is responding to the epinephrine. So adjunctive treatment. So you're pretty much guaranteed to get these uh, treatments when you go in for anaphylaxis as well. However, it's important to realize that epinephrine is the number one treatment for all of these things. Antihistamines such as Benadryl do not do any of the effects that we talked about in this presentation. Epinephrine is number number one. But you'll probably be given some diphenhydramine, some Benadryl for uh, symptom control. Also given some IV steroids, typically like methylprednisone, uh, methylprednisolone, I should say, and uh, a bronchodilator such as albuterol if continuing mild respiratory symptoms, or if you're having any respiratory symptoms at all, giving albuterol treatments would be indicated. And you can also give at home, you can also give an inhaler if you're, uh, if you're wheezing at home before the, you get to the hospital or the paramedics get there, or if your child's wheezing at home, you can definitely give an albuterol inhaler or a nebulizer. So biphasic slash rebound anaphylaxis is a repeated symptoms of anaphylaxis after an asymptomatic period without the original allergen being reintroduced. So a patient may be observed for a period of time to watch for a biphasic reaction. So this is why they'll typically keep you in the ER or they'll admit a patient, depending on how bad the reaction is, uh, just to watch for any reoccurring symptoms. The medical team doesn't want the patient going home and having anaphylaxis all over again without being um, in the hospital with resources. So they'll definitely watch the patient to make sure that everything is okay and the symptoms aren't gonna come back. And this typically happens in 10 to 20% of anaphylactic reactions. So it's pretty much guaranteed that you'll be observed for some period of time, at least four hours for sure. So if you experience anaphylaxis at home, Obviously, it's super important to know your symptoms. Carry your epinephrine auto-injector everywhere. Don't forget, don't forget to bring two. Administer epinephrine right away. Note the time and start a timer. So if, a, if your child or you, go, uh, you're going to anaphylaxis and you administer epinephrine, 
it's really important for the medical team to know, A, what dose of epinephrine you gave, and B, what time you gave it. Because anaphylaxis is very time-based. The treatment is extremely time-based. So if you're able to administer that epinephrine and either look at your phone or write down the time, that'll be super helpful for when you get to the ER and they say, hey, what have you taken already? Have you been, have you received epinephrine? Did you get anything? Knowing the time and how much is super important. And also know the time if you give a second dose of epinephrine, just so the medical team knows if you or your child responded to the epinephrine in time. And so obviously call for help immediately. On your left, um, on your right, I'm sorry, uh, there are pictures of the two common epinephrine auto-injectors. We have the AviQ and the EpiPen. The AviQ, the pediatric one, uh, 0.15 milligrams of epinephrine, and then your red one, which is 0.3 milligrams, that's the adult one. Um, if you say to the medical team, like, I gave my blue AviQ, typically they'll know that's 0.15 milligrams, but just knowing the dose is, I think, helpful for everyone. And then at the bottom, we have an epi EpiPen. Yellow one is the adult one, uh, adults over, weighing over 25 kilos, and then the green one is the pediatric one. This, Know what you carry around, very important to know. Next, so when you are at the hospital, ask questions. So many times parents come in and they feel like they can't ask questions because the medical team is working, it seems like there, it's all over the place and there are beeps going on and, and everything's chaotic, which happens. Um, but don't be afraid to ask questions. You, of all people, deserve to know what's going on. If you're the patient, you deserve to know what's going on, why it's happening, why we do the things that we do. Very important. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Advocate for yourself. That's super, super important. If you have this really bad feeling inside and there's no one in the room, get your call light. Ask your nurse to come in. Make sure you tell someone. Don't be afraid to say that because we want to hear from you. We, we want to know if anything's wrong with you. We want to make sure you're comfortable, right? And you know yourself and your child better than anyone there. Make sure that you speak up if you think something is wrong. It is the time to speak up. Don't be afraid at all. Uh, and then going home, when you get discharged, they will make, they should make sure that you have an epinephrine auto injector. We want to watch out for that rebound anaphylaxis. Even if you have been observed, we want to make sure that if something does happen again, that you are prepared. Uh, make sure you have an anaphylaxis action plan. You know to get to the hospital, you know what to come back to the hospital for, you know what symptoms to look out for, you know who to call, and if you have a follow-up appointment, you can ask questions there. It, that should all be in your discharge instructions, but you can double check with your nurse or a doctor. On your right is a wonderful food allergy and anaphylaxis emergency action plan from FAIR. It is great. Um, I love this uh, action plan. I have it for myself. Um, I think it's super great for the severe symptoms and the mild symptom diagram of when to give epinephrine. Super important. I know there's a magnet somewhere because my parents have it in my fridge and I think it's great. Uh, knowing the symptoms, uh, when to give epinephrine and what to do when epinephrine is given is super, super important, especially in a high stress situation ideal. So having this on file for yourself, you can give it to your friends, you can give it to your teacher, um, parents, have it. just having this on the fridge I think is super, super important, super helpful. So head over to foodallergy.org uh, to find this. It's a really great one. Or you might get one from your allergist. Your allergist might have one too. I just really like this one because it's got nice pictures. So that's the end of my presentation. So if you have any questions, I'm available for a Q&A. We have uh, someone here to moderate the Q&A. Uh, so again, if you have any questions, any comments, any stories that you'd like to share of anaphylaxis before, um, feel free to share those stories. I think having someone uh, to relate to for all of us would be really, really helpful. So thank you so much for listening today. I hope you have a really great time at the FAIR Summit on the rest of this weekend, and uh, see you in the Q&A.